Welcome to How I Became a Theosophist. I'm Dan Smola. It's a little program we do out of the Henry S. Olcott Memorial Library, so we can get, all get to know each other. Um, so we're celebrating more than books. We're celebrating very special people. <laughs> and um, I'm really glad to have uh, Winnie Wiley is here for Summer mm -hmm. National Conference. And just in talking with her in passing at lunch, I just got more and more fascinated by you have interesting things to say about everything, let alone the fact that you have this rich history in theosophy. So maybe we could start with that. You're, you're, you grew up in theosophy. Mm -hmm. um, if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, one of my first memories is when I was two years old and I was taken by my parents to a picnic uh, at Edwin Lord's um, place, and there were there was a huge gathering of theosophists uh, at, at next to a lake, and I was two years old. I stepped off into the water and began to drown. I was floating up and down. I wasn't afraid, but <laughs> but I was floating up and down. I'm not sure why I wasn't afraid because <laughs> I was just quite comfortable in the water. But just at the last minute, one of the theosophists pulled me out of the water and uh, I was okay. Wow. But I never was afraid of water, even in spite of that. But anyway, I always felt that uh, I had a theosophical family around me, watching over me. I think maybe that was one uh, occasion when, that, when I felt that very strongly. Did somebody physically pull you out of the water? Mm -hmm. To Okay. Um, and, and so your father, and also your father's father, or you, are you the third generation of theosophists? No. Oh. Uh, no, I'm just the second. Second uh, my, generation. My mother and father were both theosophists. Okay. Uh -huh. oh, do you want to hear anything about my father? Please. Okay. My father was a very unusual uh, person, because, partly because of his history. Um, he was, uh, his mother died when he was only five years old. He grew up in Vermont. And it was very hard for his father because his father worked on the trains and he couldn't take care of my father. So he put him up for adoption and he was adopted by a family that a mother, uh, the, his adopted mother was related to his real mother. But um, anyway, uh, he, he, kept, he wrote his father a letter um, before, uh, you know, shortly after he was adopted. And uh, it was a lovely letter, I still have it. And uh, then his adopted father died when he was eight. So uh, then he was sent by his uh, stepmother to stay with relatives of his real family in Chicago. And uh, he made friends, he had many friends nearby and uh, one day there was uh, supposed to be a circus and he was supposed to go to the circus but he was sick so he couldn't go but it was the, d the day of the Chicago fire and it burned the circus tent and many of his closest um, friends were uh, burned in the fire and he was called in to identify them hmm. very very difficult uh, beginning and um, a Catholic priest um, thought that he was having a lot of problems and that he needed his mother, so he contacted his stepmother, who was uh, the dean of a woman's college in Walla Walla, Washington. And she came and she took him back to Washington with her. And she was one who loved history very, very much. I'm sure that's, my father began to really like history because of that. But somehow or other, and I don't really know, I never asked my father, I should have, he went out on his own at the age of 13 and began helping with putting up the power lines that were crossing the West oh. um, when he was uh, very, very, very young. And from that, uh, he went into the Army, the First World War, he was a sergeant. He was very good with men, so they said. And so they gave him the, the most difficult troops to train so they would be ready to go overseas. And he was very unhappy with that. He really wanted to go overseas himself and he, he made application 
to do that. And uh, so finally he came through, his orders came through, and they sent him by train across to New York City. And he put up on a ship headed out for uh, Europe, when armistice was declared, the ship turned around and he was put off in New York. And he was, of course, happy. It was very good that yeah. the war was over with and so forth. And he, then he decided he would try to find his sisters. He had uh, sisters who were in Vermont, and he learned that he had one sister that was in Detroit, Michigan. So he went to Detroit, Michigan to see if he could find her. And uh, her name was Bess Palmer. And when um, he contacted her, um, she, he found he was very, very happy to find a relative. And she was uh, a very interesting person um, because uh, she read tea leaves. And a, a very wealthy member of uh, the Theosophical Society at that time, a man named, a um, uh, man named, I forgot his name right now. Anyway, uh, he went to the um, he went for a, a tea, and uh, she read his tea leaves, and she told him that he had a friend uh, who had recently died, and she told him a lot of information about the friend, and he he had not kept in contact with this friend, and when he contacted uh, when he made an effort, he discovered that it, she was absolutely right. He had died and many other details that she had given him were true. So um, he became very interested and wanted her to, to read tea leaves some more, but she refused to do it because she felt that this was diverting and not really uh, getting into serious things. And my, she understood that my father was searching for something, yeah. so she said, I think I, I think I have the organization that you would like. So she took him to the Theosophical Society in Detroit and the minute he got there, he, he felt that he was at home. He was very, very happy uh, to be there. Um, and uh, shortly after that, he must have joined uh, the Liberal Catholic Church. He became oh. a priest in the Liberal Catholic Church. And uh, he opened the door for my mother uh, to, when she was coming to the church. Uh, and that's how they met. And then uh, they got married shortly after that. And uh, then uh, my brother was born first. He was two years older than me. And then uh, w after I was born, um, then, uh, I mean, I think we found, I mean, as I say, we, I was really in theoso theosophical groups all the time. Yeah, and, and so you and your parents must have known some Amazing people, amazing. That's the right. We knew uh, well. Uh, Zena Potter uh, was a really quite special woman. Um, about Zena, yeah. um, well, first of all, I should explain that most of my memory of Theosophy has to do with the meetings which were held on the 13th floor of the Wurlitzer Building in downtown Detroit. It was right at the end of the elevator. You 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 would get up uh, to almost to this floor, and then you had to k climb steps to get up to the uh, to the big uh, <laughs> auditorium. And you had to earn it. That, that's right. You had to earn it. The last end. Anyway, um, and um, we had many many lectures there. Um, let's see. It would be Edwin Lord was one of the members there who gave talks and. Uh, Alvin Boy Coon, mm -hmm. and um, let's see, and uh, let's see. I should have thought of this before. It's all right. You, your yeah. father also knew Mr. Kern. Oh, he yes, he knew. Yeah. Uh, he knew that was at a later period. Okay. But yes, he did. He yeah. knew Kern. Yeah. Uh, very well, and uh, he, Mr. Kern, I think, was in the hospital with some illness at some point, and I know that he visited uh, him, but uh, I think. I mean, my father was very, very unusual. He was hmm. always <laughs> going to visit people who were ill. I don't really? know how he had the energy to do all that he did. Yeah. Because... Uh, it sounds like you were very close with your father. I was very close to my father. I was very shy. <laughs> he would try to get me to talk more and come really? and be more... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, outgoing. Uh, I, actually, I think he probably succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so it sounds like a very rich childhood. Um, grow- and you grew up in kind of one of the golden eras of theosophy in a yeah. very active area for yeah. it. My father uh, was also the president of the Vegetarian Society in Detroit. And that was another thing I was brought up, brought up as a vegetarian at a time when being a vegetarian was to be a pioneer. Yeah. And uh, it was hard uh, because many of my playmates, um, I lived on Pingree Street in Detroit, and which was mostly Jewish, and my best friend was Olga Nikoloff, who played the violin. And uh, I just remember that once or twice that she offered me chicken uh, to eat, uh, which was, I mean, yeah. maybe for children to be expected. Yeah. But I, dis- I had to make a decision at that time and I decided that I did not want to be responsible for being cruel to animals. So th- that's what kept me a vegetarian all my life. I've always been a vegetarian. So I want to ask you more things about um, um, your, your life, but before we talk more about this life, <laughs> one thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, what we talked about earlier at lunch, which is, um, uh, past lives, mm-hmm. and you had the good fortune of meeting somebody gifted in this area uh, who could help you, uh, Dora, right, mm-hmm. Dora Coons. That's right. And so could you talk a little bit about that and, okay. you, and your interest in the subject in general? Well, um, when I went to college, uh, I got my degree at University of Michigan in classical studies, and uh, that included classical Greek and wow. Latin. Anyway, uh, I was very drawn to the classical world, I but I wasn't I mean, actually, I wanted to be an archaeologist, but I didn't want to be an American archaeologist because I felt that American archaeology was very backward and uh, was, I mean, did not appreciate the fact that there were, uh, there were people living in America many, many years ago. They thought that only the Clovis people, the, the period of archaeology when human beings first came to America, was when they discovered the points called the Clovis points. And that's, uh, I, I'm not going to be perfectly accurate, I think it was about 12,000 years ago. And uh, I thought that humans were here in America many thousands of years before. And now this is what the, the archaeological world is acknowledging now, that in fact men and women lived in America many, many years earlier. They've done a a genetic study of Indians in the Great Lakes area and they have now decided from the genes of the Ojibwe Indians that they have a heritage of the um, Salutrian people of Europe which trace back to about 35,000 years ago. The, the latest uh, cave discovered which was um, part of their uh, culture was uh, Chauvet uh, with beautiful paintings of animals on the cave walls, which, I mean, they, they reflect uh, an appreciation of shades and shadows and, uh, and a very sophisticated painting. Where is that cave? In France. Oh, in France, okay, yeah. Uh-huh. And therefore, um, they, now they feel that these people had to have come to America yeah. since they were ancestors of the Ojibwe, but they don't know how they got here because science believes that all of the Atlantic Ocean was at this time frozen and very difficult to cross and so they have uh, they have designed and believe that they came in boats like the Eskimos ride in skin boats and then got on the icebergs uh, periodically to rest and then came on to the United States and your um uh, literal association or past life association? Yes, yeah. well, when I mentioned that I was interested in yeah. uh, the Greeks um, here at Alcott, uh, this was when Dora was president. Anyway, I didn't ask anybody to look into my past. I thought that was somewhat presumptuous, but I was very happy one day to receive a letter from Dora, and she said that I was. Uh, in Sicily in a past life, but not of the, the criminal class, which uh, it, it, of course, has a reputation for. And, uh, and all, but all of the east coast of 
Sicily has Tarmina and Syracuse, many of the centers which were Greek uh, settlements. And so this is just one of the many out-of-the-box subjects that I've enjoyed talking to you about. You recommended a great book for our library on uh, reincarnation research, oh, yeah. uh, Life Before Life, Right. Um, talking about specifically uh, yeah. focusing on American uh, yes. chil children. That's right. I feel that the matter of reincarnation, in my mind, has mm -hmm. been proved. Even though I've always believed in reincarnation because I was raised in the Theosophical Society, I felt that it was necessary to see in uh, evidence from our modern day um, something that would prove that. And this seems to me to prove it because my life has been spent uh, teaching children yeah. and very small children in the beginning. And I can't believe that a three-year-old would make up uh, a story and say he was uh, born in a past life and give all the details about it, which can be researched and then you trace it back and find it out. There are many uh, different occasions when children have done this. They just don't make things up. Three-year-olds tell you the truth, often when you wish they wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I believe that's been proved that uh, reincarnation is um, a fact. Of course, uh, I think it's, it changes everyone's, it should change everyone's perspective because if you have many lives in which to uh, acquire wisdom, uh, you, uh, it's not the same as um, being condemned to hell for uh, mistakes you made in one life or another because, well, actually what they say is that the word sin is taken from, I believe, uh, the Greek, and it means to miss the mark. Mm. And therefore, uh, it's, uh, it would be unthinkable for a, 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 a benevolent God or any creation to condemn anybody for making a mistake when they did not understand the situation. And I think many lifetimes, eventually, people do understand. And, and Another subject, of course, that you're interested in is education mm -hmm. from a theosophical or spiritual perspective. Uh -huh. So you've had a rich career uh -huh. with education. Um, you, I think you started a Montessori school. I started the first Montessori school in Michigan, um, but uh, I did it with my sister-in-law. It was after I had graduated from college, and uh, she and I talked and felt that it was that education for preschool children was just not adequate, that it was not really reaching the children. I feel that two-year-old and three-year-old and four-year-old children are far wiser and far more um, sensitive and perceptive than people realize. And uh, they, one of the features of Montessori is to train children into independence by providing them with uh, guidance and help in learning to do all kinds of activities for themselves, like even such a thing as putting their jacket on by themselves or mm -hmm. tying their own shoes. She felt that it was a, a real shame for uh, children to be dependent, either raised by a nanny or being very dependent upon their parents to do everything for them when they really want to be creative and do things for themselves. In fact, uh, they, they begin to walk you don't teach them to walk. The child teaches himself to walk. And they, you don't teach him to talk, although, of course, you need to be talking when he's around. He just, uh, he just is determined to learn what you're saying. And he learns whatever language it is that you're speaking. That's what a two- and three-year-old child learns. And they're very, very fast and good at doing this. So um, it's, uh, I think they're underestimated a very great deal. You taught for how many years? 42 years is what I taught. What I did is I taught the preschool age children for 14 years, and then I went to Italy and took training for the elementary Montessori, and then I went on to teach for more years. Did your teaching change as you, as you yourself oh. grew? Oh yes, very much so. When I took the Montessori training in Italy, it became very obvious that you, you, you had to be a renaissance teacher to teach in the elementary because you have to absorb the whole curriculum, the history, science, geography, geometry, mathematics, 
uh, everything you have to absorb in order to uh, teach the child at the right level so that when you're um, talking about uh, mathematics, how much of mathematics does this child understand? And then you must introduce them to the next level of math. And also there are an enormous number of materials that Montessori designed to be self-teaching for the children. And also one characteristic of Montessori that I think the modern world is in desperate need of, and that is the materials that are offered the child in Montessori are offered to a two, two and a half year old, to a three year old, to a four year old, the same material, because the material has secrets to tell, even after he's understood the significance of a particular piece of material, he can look deeper and understand even more by uh, continuing to work with the same material. And I think that in our modern world, we tend not to look deeply. We think we've understood something by having one explanation. And what is needed is look, to look deeper and deeper in order to truly understand any facet of life. And, and I know, sort of in general, um, one, one thing that I found real refreshing is that you feel your, your um, approach to theosophy is that it cannot be separated from everyday life. Oh no, that's true. That's true. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so maybe part of, part of your theosophy is almost a sense of responsibility to yes, that's engage right. in life. Yes, that's right. Which not everybody shares with you. No, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's just talk about a couple aspects. Um, that we talked about before. One, I know one of your many passions also is um, discussing the environment. Oh yes, exactly. And um, uh, there's so much to, to talk about. There seems like there's yeah. so, quite a mess. But 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 you do you feel that? And this is uh, some theosophists disagree. But you feel that much of the mess is definitely man-made. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Oh yes. Um, well, uh, part of the complications of uh, Destruction of the environment have to do with the treatment of um, plant life and animal life. Um, in the treatment of plant life, I believe we are far too little appreciative of the role of trees and other green uh, growing things in life. We could not exist without the fact that trees and other plants absorb carbon dioxide and give off oxygen which uh, both cleans the air and provides oxygen for humans to breathe. And also with animals, we're, we're so cruel to animals, it's beyond imagination how uh, people can be so cruel. And if people stopped being cruel and had compassion for cows, especially cows and steers and animals of the, that, the large animals, um, what would happen is we would have to provide pasture land of uh, open grassland for them, for them to be naturally uh, able to eat. And America would have to be twice the size that it is for us to be able to provide the grassland that the number of cows we are now raising uh, would need. And this then is saying something about what we're doing that is really uh, destroying the environment. The, the, the cows have uh, give off methane, which is more poisonous than carbon dioxide. Um, but the one good thing about methane is that it can, it can be more quickly cleared from the atmosphere once we stop doing uh, the damaging uh, things to the environment. Um, this is a little bit of a weird question, but <clears throat> what do you think it means to be spiritual? Uh -huh. Yes, oh, I think being spiritual is the goal of all people. And um, th I think uh, St. Augustine said that all people are really seeking happiness, and I think this is true. Um, and it's, he's, what he said was, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're going off to war, whether you're staying at home, or um, whether you're with a lot of people, or whether you're alone, what you want is happiness, what you're hoping for is happiness. And so very few people seem to have it. So how is it that they know what happiness is, and they know that it's missing? And but you seem to have it. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> so how is that? How, how come you have it? <laughs> 
I think it's a matter of, uh, <laughs> of quietness. There's a wonderful man, uh, he happened to be black, a young black man, um, who needed to grow more. He felt, he told his father he needed time to mature, but he decided that what he would do is stop talking and he wouldn't talk at all, but would travel and would uh, be silent. And this is what he did. He did it for a number of years and he's now an expert in, uh, in, in the environment. And he, he speaks in colleges and places of this sort. But that's because in yeah. his search and in his silence, he was able to find a secret, a secret of life, I think, which is a balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we need to be in balance and uh, that's one of our problems right now. And do you still practice uh, silence? I, I practice silence, mm -hmm. yes. Um, have, you, have there been any favorite theosophical books um, for you? Um. Favorite books? Uh, yeah, well, a lot of them. Uh, I, like, uh, I, like, I like Leadbeater. I like Annie Besant. I like Blavatsky. I've been uh, working on studying the Secret Doctrine recently and very much appreciate uh, her in enormous uh, perception. One of the things she said was that uh, theosophy is not something new. And if you stop and think, what does she mean? That all of, this, the, all of the things that she talks about, such as reincarnation and karma and so forth, are all old, old, old stories. Mm. So you can go back to the Gnostics for the Christians, and they believed in reincarnation. Uh, and then, of course, Buddha, Buddhism and Hinduism and so forth had reincarnation. And uh, many of them had uh, a deep, well, I think that the, that Blavatsky and Alcott went to India uh, to help defend India um, and the Hindu perspective from the Christian missionaries who were very critical and very um, superior, feeling very superior yeah. to the uh, Indians. And much, much of the vocabulary which is in the, in the Theosophical Society is actually Hindu. I mean, Atma, Bodhi, Manas, and so forth, all of these things. And I think this is, uh, but of course it's very old. Hinduism is older than Christianity even. And, uh, but they all, these great religions have, in a sense, the same secrets. And one needs only to look deeply to realize that this is so. And so this is where you get your uh, eternal news. And, but I also wanted to know, where do you get your everyday temporal news? Because We've only brushed the surface here, trust me. Um, this woman can talk about just about anything with detail. <laughs> it's amazing. So where, how, do you, where, how do you learn about everyday uh, issues? Uh -huh. and w well, I read, uh, I read Time, I read Newsweek, I read the Ann Arbor News, I read, uh, I look at, I watch news on television. Usually I like uh, PBS. It's uh, very much more uh, in depth, news in depth, and very um, and very much less biased, I think, than many of the other places to get news. Yeah. So I like that, and and also I just like talking to people about news. I find a lot out about that, and also I have a lot of favorite books. I have one particular book that talks about the environment that talks about the problems we have with global warming and, and uh, carbon dioxide. It's, um, it's call, called Under the Green Sky. It's written by Peter Ward. And it talks about, it's really very frightening if you read it, and yet it's dealing with the truth of the situation. And he says uh, that one of the problems is that the Atlantic Ocean is so very, very important uh, to the climate and, and the well-being of both Europe and America. He, and he says, he talks about the North Atlantic and that the uh, pteropods are, are having their, the shells of the pteropods are eroding off of them uh, because of the high acidic level in the ocean. And um, there's so many things to do with the ocean that are crucial. Um, there's a thermaline current 
which um, r in the north part of the Atlantic, the cold water drops down and flows southward. And that brings uh, oxygen and food particles and everything for the uh, living animals in the south part of the Atlantic. And of course, the, the warm current of the Atlantic flows northward, which heats up, in, gives heat to England and Ireland, which if without that, it would be very cold there. So uh, what's happening to that current is that um, the Atlantic Ocean is now melting and warming the ice. And as it gets warmer, that thermally current will no longer flow southward. And, uh, and then, who knows, I, do not, I don't think science knows exactly what will happen. But it means that the creatures on the south, on the bottom of the ocean, will, many of them will die. And uh, it can be also a, a very dangerous period for Americans as well. Could I play devil's advocate for Sure, a please. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. What if about this perspective? Some might say, when you have all this rich spiritual literature with theosophy, and, 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 and we've, we've, we've told you about the different planes, and there's higher levels of consciousness. Yes. And Please, Winnie, why don't you go up here where it's nice, uh -huh. up here in this higher level, because uh -huh. it's nice and clean and it's nice and pure. You're spending all your time, uh, the ocean's polluted, it's yeah. all dirt, come on, yeah. leave yeah. that alone. Yeah. It's, it's, it's temporary anyways. We yeah. have, why do you mess around with these things that are, temp are, that are temporary and dense uh -huh. and physical? Is, why yeah. is that important? Well, what I think is it has to do with the heart. Um, I think that we have to... We are not just human beings. I think that we think that we humans are the only um, important creatures on Earth often. And this is really very sad because animals have such a rich life which we don't understand because we don't respect them. And plants have a very rich life as well. I, uh, we have a, I have a yard outside my the school, the downstairs Montessori school at, where I live, and um, I saw a, a tree, a young tree, growing in it, and the leaves were very, very green. It was looking wonderfully rich and uh, healthy, and it was growing very quickly. So I said to the Heidi, the Montessori teacher, I said to her, are you meditating uh, on that tree? She said, yes, and I'm getting the children to do it too. <laughs> anyway, that's one feature that we need to appreciate, that our minds and our hearts uh, can make a dramatic change in any of the life around us if we only have sufficient love and appreciation for both the plants and the animals. And it's a, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way so street. Love, we'll get love yeah, back. that's right, exactly. Yeah. Yes. What, what do you think is the biggest challenge for the society right now, the Theosophical Society? Um, well, uh, I think, I, th I need to think about this a little bit. It's okay. Um, I believe that many people in the society are coming from um, unsatisfactory experiences in their search for the spiritual world. I believe it's one-third of Americans will assign themselves as spiritual rather than any religion. They oh. say they're spiritual, so they're searching. And they want something that will tell them without, um, without any uh, ulterior motive, will simply tell them, this is the way it seems to me to be true. I've done a lot of research and this seems to me a really good path to follow. And I think the society needs to get, uh, to be very clear. I think the work technology has been a big help to the Theosophical Society. Um, I have, there was a young man, I should say, this was interesting. I was in Detroit Lodge at the meeting on Tuesday night, uh, one night, and in walked a young man. His name was Michael. And he said, I'd like to join the Theosophical Society. And I said, well, how'd you hear about that? And he said he had seen a DVD of the Dalai Lama. Oh. And so that uh, he was just already, this was surely what he was looking for. 
and I think that the society must reach many more people than it is in order for them, I mean, because I think people are looking and... Um, okay, so we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to satisfy a very deep a quest in people's lives, and I believe that many, many people are ready to um, to turn their lives around and uh, to express love and appreciation for animals and plants. You you mentioned today about writing a book. You might write a book. Oh yeah. Okay. I hope you do. Thank you. Um, and I jokingly, but it's really not. A, I, I wish you would start a blog. Oh. <laughs> there. Uh, okay. Anyways, we could talk about it later. Yeah. Right. Um, sure. Um, yeah. So you've kind of already answered it, but the last question I always ask people is, is, is in the near future of the Theosophical Society, both in America and internationally, what would be your ideal scenario, say 25 or 30 years from now? Mm. What would you like, where would you like to see the society go, focus, or what area? I think you've kind of talked about mm -hmm. it already, but um, what especially do you think we should try to focus on? Well, um I think that all of us would like happiness, and I don't believe happiness is to be found in um, satisfying our uh, physical needs. I mean, I look at a person like Marilyn Monroe, for instance, you would have thought she had uh, fame, she had beauty, um, she was very um, appealing to so many millions of people, and she's still appealing because she's still being, her picture is still being shown and so yeah. forth and yet she was very unhappy because otherwise she wouldn't have turned to drugs or other things to uh, escape her difficulties so what was the cause of her difficulties and there are many other people Michael Jackson uh, many other people for whom you could say the same thing yeah and I think that happiness isn't to be found in fame or money or things, having lots and lots of things, or uh, any of those areas, I think it's to be found in uh, in loving people and loving animals and loving life, uh, and uh, and just uh, enjoying uh, what is there to see, because often um, you, we just walk down the street. There's the beautiful beautiful animals and beautiful plants and lovely people and we just don't pay any attention to them because we have in mind uh, some we, we want to buy something at the store or we whatever <laughs> well I wish I could ask you a bunch more questions but I don't want to keep you too long but uh, <laughs> it's, I just like listening to you um, I, I said that was the last question but I'm gonna I'm gonna slip one more in there you've kind of answered this already but um, what other general advice would you give to a new person, a new person to theosophy? Okay, well, um, I think that uh, becoming a member of the Theosophical Society is a great challenge because, as Blavatsky said, theosophy is not something new. What that means is that you, as a member of the Society, are on your own, in a way, to pursue the truth. And uh, be, so, so what you've got to do is make yourself a Renaissance person, but that's very exciting because, <laughs> uh, in a in a in a sense, you you have questions and and many answers in so many different fields, and actually life will lead you. This is what I find that uh, just when I think, oh, I've I've uh, read that book and so forth, and I wonder what's new, and then suddenly another book will will show itself, and with a wonderful, fascinating subject. And um, so there's a never-ending field of wonderful uh, things ahead for you. <laughs> so I, I just want to thank you uh, oh, sure. uh, for sitting here and for sharing. And I think um, uh, I, uh, I uh, hopefully you'll finish that book and, um, uh, and even consider the blog. Oh, okay, thank you. Winnie Wiley, what a, <laughs> what a treat. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>